You're listening to the Brees Creator Podcast. I'm Lee Brees, and this episode, the topic of discussion is minimalistic creativity, talking about how less creates more, fostering inspiration, and controlling creativity. Not to be discouraged, no matter what your interest is, your career, your hobby, your lifestyle, there's something in this episode for you. So listen in the entire time for an interesting conversation, great stories, and maybe a joke or two. So I want to get this episode started by talking about what I've learned this week. I have learned so much um, about podcasting in general, and I've had the opportunity to listen to a lot of great podcasts uh, via iTunes and SoundCloud and whatnot. Um, And I've really kind of learned more about what podcasting is, kind of helping me decide and define what the Breeze Creator Podcast is going to be. Um, And so with that said, I've decided after listening to the final episode of the Ignited pilot series that I'm not going to release it Um, simply because it's it's not really what podcasting is. And I don't feel like it's right for what I'm trying to accomplish with uh, this podcast. So I'm going to keep just the Breeze Creator podcast series, work on that, put all my effort into that, hopefully expand that into be something uh, that is inspirational and connects uh, lots of people to ideas and inspires them to be their own creators. So the topic of discussion in this episode is minimalistic creativity. So I want to talk about that just a little bit because um, I've had a lot of experience with that simply because I was, I feel like I was born that way. It's kind of interesting is, you know, you, you hear all about these things about people who are minimalists uh, saying that uh, you know, they decided to become a minimalist. Uh, you know, they, after acquiring all this stuff or having kids or they finally reached the kind of lifestyle that they want, that they then decide to become a minimalist. Whereas I personally feel like uh, since birth, I was born one. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a second. Um, but for those of you who don't know what minimalism is, uh, the discussion at the heart of minimalism is that you're happier with less, is that you do don't see the advantages of material things and you get more out of life by having less stuff. Um, there's been broader definitions, expansions on that definition, uh, especially by uh, specific groups, um, but that's at the heart of what it is. And what's interesting about being born a minimalist is that I've also been born a, a woodworker, a creator, a maker, um, an artist, um, all those kind of things. And so minimalism has really been the center point of how I create, what my inspiration is, um, and how I use the things that I make or why I make the things that I make. Uh, So, for example, every time I design something or I make something uh, to make my life better, uh, it's always got kind of has function at the heart of it. If it if it doesn't function, there's no point in making it. I hate things that are fake. I hate looking at uh, moldings on pieces of furniture that are fake um, simply because I am just so minimalistic that I I only want to see uh, something that serves a purpose. I don't like seeing things that don't serve a purpose. And kind of I've talked about it and alluded to it in the pilot episode and in the first episode is that, you know, the reason I get into this, the reason I continue to do it, the reason why I make time to get out in the shop on weekends is because I want to make my life better. I don't want to go out to the store and buy something when I can just make it myself. Um, and that's really what the mission is of this podcast. I say I say the mission of this podcast in every episode, but I want to inspire people to realize that they have so much power uh, in their hands and their minds with their creativity um, and the abilities that they choose to acquire and that they already have. Many people are talented um, and hands-on skills, but because they've been put on a, on a, on a life cycle, on a life path, that has steered them in a direction that says only this, only this, only this, whereas um, other people who have chosen not to do that have been able to go through life with an open mind, kind of take life as it comes, find a career that interests them, something that they're really passionate about, whereas other people, like I said, pick one thing and they stick with it for you know, their entire lives. Uh, Some people do things for their entire life and they never get the opportunity to experience anything else. Um, And especially being a young 
person who's about to go to college. That's something that's kind of frustrating uh, to be thinking about, to be discussing, to have conversations about, because the more I discuss it and the more I learn from other people is that, I mean, college definitely has been the success path for a lot of people. Um, but it, there's other people who weren't successful with college, but it wasn't because they didn't go to, they didn't choose to go to college. It was because they didn't have an opportunity to go to college and they just made something work. I've yet to meet someone who deliberately chose and said, I'm going to be better off by not going to college and doing something else, whether it's in the trades, whether it's working at a job right at high school, um, whether it's doing whatever, something you're trained in, getting an internship, just learning on the job. And that's the other thing that's kind of sad too. I've really had this issue with, with, with school and it's really kind of affected my ability to learn is that you know I, 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 want, I aspire to be the people in my community. I want to be a business owner. I want to be a politician. I want to be influential. I want to be an adult. I've, you know I, every kid feels like that when they're really young and I, I still at uh, an 18 year old kid, I still say that. But with that aspiration, um, I look at I look at school and I take it on in a way that shuts out everything and it's kind of been frustrating because I've had to fight that my entire life because uh, you know, business people, they don't like it when people waste their time. And that's kind of what I've learned about me is that I don't like it when people waste my time. Um, so if I'm sitting in a classroom um, and trying to learn something, uh, I see the point in a lot of things. I think I, I'm really good at paying attention in class and listening um, and trying to get something from the teacher. But at the same time, you know, when I'm sitting in my basement, you know, realizing I could be doing this, I could be doing this, I could be doing this. Why should I do this homework or whatnot? And I'm learning that it's more about, well, teaching you the thought process, teaching you how to learn, you know, developing and building your mind for future opportunities and future learning opportunities. It's like, I just want to learn everything I need to know and move on and start a life, have a family, become successful, really begin to enjoy life. And so with that mindset, my entire life, I've been in a place where I despised everything that I did and I really, and I tried to do everything and I got a little bit out of, out of everything and I think the opportunities that were created and the things that I learned kind of molded into each other. Um, you never know what is going to come in handy down the road. Uh, you hear multiple people always talk about um, how if you have an opportunity, take advantage of it, do it um, because you never know what's going to mesh later down the road. And so I've taken that to full heart, but then at the same time, it's like beating a sledgehammer against a backhoe. Uh, you know, one's going to overpower the other, but you're still constantly fighting, trying to stop uh, what, particularly for me, what I'm thinking, trying to advance myself. I know I have to go to college. I know if I want to be successful, I need to do that. I think there's definitely an avenue for a lot of people uh, to go without college, to be successful without doing that. Um, but for me, definitely with what I want to do, college is something that I desperately need. But the problem is that a lot of things I complain about in school are things I'm going to complain about in college. Um, I don't take, you know, the, the frustrating thing about high school is that you have to take all these classes that are required. You're required to take four years of this and four years of that. And a lot of those things I'm not interested in. For instance... I am not a math and science person, yet I'm in a very high math course, and I'm taking AP Physics. Now, I love engineering. I love getting on AutoCAD and designing and making things, um, and I thought physics would kind of fit along with that, but I'm learning now that physics is nowhere, any shape or form, have anything to do with design, creation, uh, inspiration, making, improving people's lives. Um, it's a very scientific, very math thing, and I've just had to kind of stick it out the whole year. Um, not saying that I'm not getting something out of it, um, because I everything that I do, I try to get something out of it. Whether it's a project that I'm working on, whether it's a dinner with uh, my with my mom, um, whether I'm doing something that I don't want to do, but I take advantage of every opportunity that's been given me. And it's really, you know, they talk like I talked about earlier. You know, the reason they have you take. You know, certain classes in school is to develop your brain and teach you how to learn. A lot of these opportunities that have been created have taught me um, how to approach things, how to understand things, what to take from things. And that's an intangible skill that I don't think I would have gotten any other way. I think also, too, I've been gifted with this perspective as well because I've done so much and witnessed so many different types of people um, along the way and the different opportunities that I've really been able to develop a skill set that's just you, you can't acquire any other way. 
So now back to how that uh, those concepts and ideas inspire me to create minimalistically. Creating minimalistically does not necessarily mean that you make the you know uh, a stool that is very simple, uh, low materials, very thin, very lightweight, um, because decreasing the amount of stuff you have is not about is not what minimalism is about. Minimalism is more or less about increasing the value or finding what's valuable to you. It's not about burning your house down and saying you're going to live in a tent. It's about finding what's more meaningful to you. And that's what's kind of frustrating, especially because I've been born this way, I feel like. I've, 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 I played sports. I did all these clubs. I tried to do a lot of different things. I took a lot of different classes. But at the end of the day, I, did, I didn't enjoy 75% to 100% of them. So now that I'm kind of getting to this point where I need to decide what I want to do with my life and I'm cutting these things out, although I've tried to maximize every opportunity that was in front of me because I don't like the closed doors. I like to leave every door open. But like I said, now that I'm starting to close some of these doors, I'm really discovering what I'm really interested in, what the future of my life's going to be. And in ways, I don't feel complete because I'm not out there with my buddies on the basketball court, I'm not out there on the football field. I'm not, you know, making. I'm not volunteering in my community as much as I used to. But at the same point, I'm much happier. I I love being able to get in the shop every weekend. I mean, before I would just get in the shop during the summer and on winter break, and that would be it. I wouldn't have any other time to get in the shop. I mean, a project here or there. But now I'm trying to get in the shop as much as I can, and I think that I think finally feeling complete that way is kind of overpowering my 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 feelings of regret, remorse, of looking back, of reminiscence. I think all those things are being taken away because this sense of finally feeling like I'm doing what I want to do is overpowering. I'm now to the point where I'm getting out in the shop and I'm making things faster than I ever could before. One of the things that my dad always talked about um, when he was alive, um, he was a woodworker and he was an absolutely fabulous guy. He made things really, really well. Um, he was he was an absolutely master carpenter and I would not have trusted anyone else um, to do any work. And a lot of people who knew him felt that way. But a lot of the jobs that he was offered, he took down. Um, he didn't want to open up his own business simply because he felt like he was slow. He didn't feel like he could meet the production capacity that was going to be required for him to develop a great reputation and a business. And I always felt that way. I always agreed with him. I didn't think it was possible to create things, to make things uh, for a living. So I never pursued it. Um, I'm not. I'm. I say that. I'm. Y- you can tell. I'm about to go on a tangent about how that's possible, right? Uh, but at the same time, I'm not gonna pursue that. I'm not gonna try to create and make things for a living, um, because that's not what I want to do. What I want to do is is empower other people to be their own creators. You you know, people talk about it on the internet all the time that you can't make money making things, and there are people who do that. It's talking about the the average person. If you talk about the average person, the average person dies at 79. The average person goes to college. Are you the average person? I'm not the average person. So I'm going to aspire to be something different. These people who are making things on their own aren't the average person. Yeah, the average person won't succeed making things, creating things. But someone who really wants to do it will. Um, And like I said, there's been people out there who have done that, who have really been uh, able to mold themselves and make a business and a reputation off of making things. But my dad never felt that way. But what I've learned, especially since I've been able to get out in the shop more, is that I can create things uh, very, you know, quick, efficiently, well. You know, I never thought when I was two years old that I was going to be as good as my father. I'm not saying I am. I don't think I'm anywhere close. Um, but with all the inspiration I've gotten from the woodworking community and reading things online and listening to things online, um, I've definitely been inspired to say that you know there's a definite possibility that I could be as good as my dad and to me that's very rewarding and in a world where I'm constantly being stigmatized for not sitting up straight not turning homework assignments in on time um, speaking my mind things like that it's nice to it's nice and reassuring to have those feelings so the tough thing is uh, shifting gears now 
is that for makers, for creators, for people who do things with their hands, um, is that you never know when you're going to need something, a tool, um, a supply, uh, you know, for a woodworker, a piece of wood, um, a wrench, a hammer, a special tool. You know, the thing is about, especially about making, is that there's all these one-time tools that you never know when you're going to need, you never know when you're going to use, so you hold on to it. And there's people that online have openly confessed to the fact that they're tool hoarders or material hoarders um, or people who just can't let things go. And, you know, I've talked about it in previous episodes, more about my dad's tool collection, about how I had to let that go. Um, so when I, you know, obviously when I was born, um, I was born in my parents' house and uh, my dad had this very extensive tool collection that he had been collecting for a very, very long time. Um, he had gone to countless auctions, flea markets, acquiring all these old antique tools. And in this room in the basement of our house, it's actually quite a, it's actually a decent sized room, floor to ceiling nothing but these antique tools that are you know were worth tons of money each but after you know after a while he my dad succumbed to the fact that he wasn't going to be able to hold on to those things because he needed the money more than he needed the tool um, and so he had to let all those things go but he didn't he began to let things go slowly and it really wasn't after he, till after he died that we let go of so much of his collection and that's just the antique tools. I'm not even talking about the tools that he used regularly or so-called used regularly. But there's this whole thing in minimalism about, um, you know, anti-collecting. About this whole thing about, you know, you, you can't be a collector and be a minimalist. Well, you can. It's, you know, like they talk about, it's all about finding meaning, finding greater value. And if collecting something gives you value, gives you more meaning, it contributes to your purpose in life then collecting is something for you because that's what minimalism is all about. And so now that I'm kind of the point where, I mean, it's just me and my mom. I have all of my dad's tools. I have our family's house. I have, I have our shop. I need to decide now what I'm going to do with all of these things. Especially since, you know, once I start going to college, it's just going to be my mom. You know, I don't know what she's going to do with everything, whether she wants to move. Because this is a, it's a, you know, for one person, this is a, ver a fairly decent sized house. So I feel for my mother in that regard. So I want to make her feel comfortable in her living conditions. And to me, walking down the basement, walking through boxes of tools, walking through, you know, all the tools hanging on the wall, you know, all these one-time tools or tools that were from once when, uh, it, it, I'm so confused. It's so perplexing. I don't know what to do with all these things, but I'm, I'm, it's becoming more clear now what has to happen. Because, you know, one of the things I missed out on growing up was, you know, I wanted to hear more things and more stories about my parents' childhood. I want to learn about, you know, what, what made them who they were, what led them to the place that they are now. You know, I know they're my parents, but there's a, there's a greater story. I mean, they were alive years. They were alive years before I was. So obviously there's more of a story. I mean, you know, my mom always jokes and says that kids was life part two. Um, and that's kind of something that I you know, have, we've come to embrace in our family, and that's something I kind of believe in too. That kids are definitely not—they're um, part of your life, um, but they're a different part of your life. Um, so, so, in this part of life, or the biggest first part of life, um, is discovering who you are um, and finding value, finding meaning, finding your purpose. And these, the tool collection and all the stuff that my dad has isn't contributing to my purpose. I, I love working out in the shop. I love making things. I love creating things. But at the same time, not everything is necessary to do that. Not everything is increasing the value of what I make. And I got to decide whether I want to keep some of these things or when I want to get rid of some of these things. And the whole thing about being creative with minimalism is that when you create things, the reason an item is unique, the reason something you make is extraordinary or awesome is because of the limited amount of resources and tools you had. If you had every tool at your disposal, you would 3D print or CNC everything. But there's a reason things are still handmade in this computer and digitalized world today. There's a reason why computer automation hasn't dominated everything. People do things not to get them done. I mean, I talk about making things for function, but at the same time, they people make things and create things because it gives them meaning. It inspires them to do uh, to do something with themselves. Um, you know, to me, when I go out in the shop, 
I either have my plans or I have an idea. I have my materials. I shut the door. You know, there's very few windows out in the shop. And so all of a sudden I get on a tangent and I'm going. I'm in a zone. I feel a greater purpose. I can tune out everything uh, that's going on in my life. And that's why the shop has really been a sanctuary for me. Whenever I've had an issue, um, I go out there and just make something. You know, when I broke up with a, with a girlfriend, um, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a tough breakup. So that night, um, I was out there all night and I, you know, came out the next morning with, you know, two or three boxes and my mom was wondering what happened. And I just, you know, I left, I left uh, the boxes on the table and said, oh, you know, I just felt like making some boxes. Um, but yeah, it's getting out there and finding a purpose and finding value is really what allows us to tune out everything. So if you're someone who's constantly worried about something, who's constantly thinking about something, who can't sleep at night, um, those things aren't giving you value. They aren't giving you purpose. So find something that inspires you. Um, find something that m- that makes you happy, that allows you to only think about that one thing that you're doing. And there is when you found your purpose. Um, so I talk about being in the zone when I'm in the shop, but at the same time, making isn't my path. Creating isn't my path. But yet I feel this, this creative vibe, this maker vibe while I'm in the zone out there making things working with my hands, trying to understand my material and the tools, um, and how, how I'm going to apply that is yet to be seen, is unknown, because I don't know how I'm going to contribute to those things. And like we talked about earlier in this episode, is that you can't skip out on an opportunity because you never know when it's going to contribute to something. You know, one of the other things I've learned growing up is that I always thought you majored in something and you got a job in that field and that was it. And what I've learned over time is that just because you major in something doesn't mean that that's what your direct path is. So for instance, say you major in business, okay? You're going to go work at some firm and get a business job and sit at a desk and you know create great marketing strategies, find ways to improve the business, Um, And that's what I always thought, Um, but that's not necessarily the case. I mean, the job opportunities for people in that field is exponential. People in that field do a lot of different things. They do their own thing. And what's really cool, especially watching people who have become successful, they they become successful not because they, they followed the rule book. They watched what other people did. They found a way to take something that they learned or acquired or saw somebody else do and make it their own. They applied their own interests, their own skills, their hobbies, things they're passionate about, and made it their own thing. And that's something that I really aspire to do, and I hope that I can do that too. You know, I mentioned um, that I'm not going to be a creator. I'm not going to be a maker. In fact, I, w- I want to be a business person. Um, but I, I want to be a successful business person, not for me personally, but because I want to commit to a life of public service. But then I want to be able to give to people. You know, one of the things about nonprofits um, that's constantly debated is what people sh- people at nonprofits should spend funds on. And the thing is that because of that stigma, that idea that nonprofits can't, you know, they can't market their they can't market themselves. They can't get people that are going to make their business bigger or reach more people or affect more people which in itself is very disappointing because there's a lot of nonprofits that could really impact people if we got this whole got rid of this whole stigma against overhead and non for profits. But I want to commit to a life of public service because I feel like I've been given this gift of perspective um, uh, that because I've discovered that I personally can't change the world in ways that I thought I could, that I want to stand for people who have abilities, who have skills, who have passions that I don't have, who can change the world in ways that I can't. And I want to be the voice for those people who have the skills and the and the abilities and the desire to change the world because that's what I want to do. I want to change the world. And if I have to if I have to let other people change the world in order to change the world, then that's what I want to do. Um, and making and creating is going it fastens right into that. That's something that's very that is something that is at the very heart of my message of what I'm about, and that's something I'm going to incorporate. Now, that being said, this is not a political podcast, so I'll never ever mention political issues because that's not what my message is. I'm not about I'm not about debating what's going on in life because, to me, in this opinion, in my opinion, this podcast is supposed to serve a purpose that's greater than politics. This podcast is supposed to be something that enables people, inspires people, whereas politics is very reactionary. 
It's very much responding to what's already going on. And this, the idea of this podcast is to start from nothing and make something, is to make something great, something greater than this podcast. I, I'm hoping that the right people listen to this and take it as inspiration and take it in a direction that inspires them to contribute to the world in ways they wouldn't have otherwise done. So I, I hate to bring up politics. I, I swore to myself that this the entire series, I was never ever going to mention anything like that. But I think um, by illustrating that point, I think now people better understand uh, what my mission is and what my goal is behind this podcast. Um, I don't know how long I'm going to do it. I plan on doing this for a very long time. I'm going to go to Purdue University next year. I want to go to the Naval Academy after that, I'm kind of following that mission of public service. But I don't know, I don't know how long I'll be able to do this podcast given those parameters you know obviously the military is very you know very uniform very everybody very everybody's the same very you know we're all here to accomplish one mission and obviously the the military's mission um is not i don't say it's not shared it's not the same as what the mission of this podcast is so we'll just have to see you know the, the other thing is too is that i was interested in going to the naval academy since i was you know 12 years old and it wasn't until my senior year in high school i'm starting to realize that maybe that that's not the path for me i'm learning that less and less of the naval academy's mission is lining up with my mission i think there's still great opportunity there so i'm i'm still very interested in pursuing that i just don't know whether that's the thing for me. So that's why I'm going to go to Purdue University at least for a year. And plus, both of my parents are to Purdue. I'm born a Boilermaker. Um, I watch every Boilermaker game. I'm, I'm, I'm homegrown to hate IU. <laughs> so if you're from Indiana, you understand that reference. Um, if, if not, um, you're missing out on the greatest state um, in the world, and that is Indiana. So kind of going back to creating, making, um, what to do about all these tools I talked about. So my, you know, one of the things that I was wondering after my dad died was that I didn't know whether I should hold on to certain tools or get rid of certain tools. And I've already talked about that before in the sense that, you know, I didn't know what some of these things were. And I've posted pictures and asked people what things are. And it's been really great. But at the same time, I know what's the purpose of some of these tools are. I just don't know if I should keep them. I don't know if I should hold on to them. If I should, if you know, what I don't know is that, you know, as, as my skills become more advanced, if I'm ever going to use them and what I'm realizing at the core of what I personally believe, um, if I'm really born to be a minimalist. I'm going to get rid of what I'm not using now. And if I ever need it again, I know that the community behind me, the community that I'm a part of, the community that I stand for, will be there for me when I need something. You know, the thing is that, you know, after the Great Depression, people weren't able to acquire things the way they they used to be able to. And, and people couldn't afford to buy things the way they used to be able to. And so they held on to everything because they didn't know when they needed or if it had a purpose or whatnot. But now we're just entering a new world where people, where consumerism has just dominated everything. And people, you know, marketing today is viewed as tr- you're trying to create uh, an artificial desire for things. And people, and especially with the with housing and the and the way financing has has, has changed over the last century. That people are buying things that they don't really need. They're impulse buys or things that people feel like they do need or are going to make their life better. But if it's not a part of your mission, then what you're purchasing serves no purpose if it doesn't mean anything to you. So with that being said, um, I'm going to get rid of the majority of my dad's tools. I'm going to keep things that I know that I'm going to use. There's, you know, obviously, you know, the most useful things like the table saw, um, clamps, glue, you know, basic things I'm going to keep because those things allow me to allow me uh, to create with a purpose and create to my own purpose. Um, but other tools like, you know, having multiple t- paint brushes or multiples of screwdrivers, multiples of pliers, multiple sets. Those things I'm not going to hold on to because they're not contributing to my purpose. If my purpose is to inspire other people to create, then I need to hold on to the things that are going to let me do that and allow me uh, to reach the people that I need to. So I hope, and the other thing is too, is that I've talked about how this tool collection holds me down and prevents me from, you know, feeling comfortable of moving out or, you know, getting rid of the house, which is in a, in a way in itself is also a burden in terms of maintenance and things like that. But I'm going to let go of these things and and really start to understand my purpose. Because one of the other things that I complain about is this really clouded mind. And as soon as I start thinking more about my purpose and only keeping the things that my, in my life that serve a purpose, only then will I truly be complete and feel happy with myself. 
So that's going to do it for the third episode of the podcast. I do want to ask before I play the outro um, that I need some feedback. This podcast, as it is right now, the format um, is I just I just talk for half an hour. Um, a lot of podcasts are hour, hour and a half, two hours. And the, the rule is with podcasts is that they're as long as they should be. And what I want to ask uh, in terms of feedback is that I, I need to know whether the half an hour works. I, I like listening to the shorter podcast just because there's more content packed into a shorter amount of time. It's a denser, uh, denser podcast than some other ones because I listen to other podcasts that are really long and there's not a whole lot of content or the content's really spread out. So please leave a comment. Do whatever you need to do to reach us. In fact, I do have the Brees Creator Podcast has an email now, uh, Brees Creator Podcast at gmail.com. So please give us some feedback. Um, I love to hear what you what you think because this podcast is for you. It's for makers. It's for creators. In the outro of this podcast, I want to feature an artist who has released their music into the public domain. Artists who release their music into the public domain, I feel like understand what art is and how it contributes to the world around it. So I'm going to end the second episode of the Breeze Creator Podcast with Days Are Long by Silent Partner. You can find all the information about the song and more about this episode in the show notes on the website at breezewoodworking.wixsite.com slash creatorpodcast. I appreciate you listening to this episode. Thank you so much. It means a lot to me. Please share the podcast with a buddy and give us any feedback. Subscribe, like this episode, leave a comment, or send an email to the new email at breezecreatorpodcast at gmail.com. You can also tweet at us on Twitter or follow us on Instagram. I'm Lee Brees. I'll see you next time on the Brees Creator Podcast. Podcast.